Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I'm flattered to have been selected for the, for the, the talk. I'm, I feel very lucky. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Come here. Okay. So um, I thought there were, uh, what I would do is instead of going through the slides again, uh, well, we could have watched the clustering movie for 20 minutes. Uh, but uh, instead, I will just do a, a, an overview of uh, what I said yesterday. And 20 minutes is not long, so I'll just mention the results. So the it's on the stochastic block model. And I'll mention the results for both the two symmetric case. And uh, the, the recent result about the general case. And then I will expand a bit on the coding and clustering connection. I got a few questions uh, about this yesterday, so I thought it would be good to expand. I'll, I'll discuss how we get to that uh, uh, CH divergence as a fundamental limit. I went quick through the proof and, um, and open problem. So, this will be quick, and this should be only this, this one might take a few minutes. So the model in the symmetric case, that's the one that has been mainly studied up to now, at least for fundamental analysis, not for implementations or the thing, um, is like this. You have two, two groups of n over 2 nodes. So I'm telling you how you generate a random graph under the stochastic block model distribution. And then over two nodes, you connect each pair independently with probability p inside the clusters, and independently with probability q across the clusters. So p is equal to q is an erdos schrenyi model. And uh, <clears throat> there's multiple, uh, is this a whiteboard as well? or? There's multiple. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, these things always happen where you end up writing on the wall. So <clears throat> there's a recovery and detection. Uh, I'll just mention the recovery now is the property where you want to know if there exists an algorithm. And by algorithm, I'm going to call this x and at because it's a reconstruction of the n nodes. You can think of each of these nodes as a label, 0 or 1. This is a group of zeros. This is a group of ones. So you want to reconstruct these uh, variables at the nodes, given the graph. So this is a map that takes the graph, such that if the graph is drawn under this SBM, which is the sym symmetric case that I just described, then the probability that your reconstruction is not the original one tends to 0 when n tends to infinity. That's, that's the question. For what? And the question is for what p and q and n can you solve this? So, Notice here that it doesn't matter who you call 0 and who you call 1. So well, if you, when you say that this is different than that, you have to take both possible labeling for xn. If you're completely wrong, you're still correct. Okay? It's just it, the, the, the <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the, the theorem <coughs> is as follows. If p is a log n by n and q is b log n by n, I'll comment in a second about why we set the variables in that regime. Then recovery is solvable if and only if you have this equation. So this is for erdos yes, model? It's the stochastic block model, so it's a patching of two erdos yeah. Can I have a question? So that's the equation. If you have this nice phase transition with this closed form expression, uh, then uh, you can uh, recover the clusters. 
Now, if you say, okay, why, why do we care about this regime? It could be that, uh, your, for example, you work with a p, which is a by square root of n, and q, which is uh, a times n log n. That's, uh, let's say, that's b. That's what you care about. Well, then you just rewrite this thing in that form. So if you force a log n here, you can see that this is this. If I did by n times log n, then n. This becomes your new A, which is blowing up. This becomes your B, which is maybe shrinking. So this inequality becomes either always true or, always or wrong. It becomes extremal. So that's the bottleneck regime. That's where the transition happens. The only case that this does not cover is that if P and Q are of the same order, and then you have to look at the second order term, then again you can have a transition happening. But as long as they have different order, this is uh, telling you what's happening in all the regimes. This is assuming A and B. To interpret this, you will assume that A and B are changing with N. Yeah. So as long as this inequality. Yeah, exactly. But you require it also for connectivity, don't you? Uh, no, uh, there's no connectivity. This is more than connectivity. Connectivity would be just this. Connectivity would be that this is more than one. So if you write this like that. This is the condition for connectivity. So you need the graph to be connected in order to recover the nodes. If there's an isolated node, you don't know what to do with it. But you need more. You need that extra sampling. Oh, yeah, that's, the, that's for connectivity. But what I'm saying is that once you know you need log n for connectivity, this would be the condition for the connectivity. But now you need more. All right. So now the, the general results, so the general model, You have k groups of arbitrary sizes, uh, p1, p2, p3, p4. So you have the, this vector p, which is a probability vector. k is the number of groups, number of clusters. p is the relative size of each community. And then you have that matrix q, where the qij entry, it's a symmetric matrix, tells you how a group in community i and j connect. So this is q12. How group here and here connect. This would be here you have a Q44 that tells you how nodes within community 4 connect. And once you specify that symmetric matrix with entries in 0, 1, you know how the connectivity pattern is. So the as general SBM depends on this model, on this parameter, uh, and the number of nodes, P, that probability vector for the rat relative size of the communities, and Q, that symmetric matrix which has positive uh, entries in 0, 1. So the theorem here is as follows for recovery. I'll tell you maybe briefly, but I don't think there will be time what happens for detection and partial recovery. But for recovery, it's like this. Um, uh, recovery in the SBM, N, P, and then again, we're going to look at the regime where we have a fixed matrix Q. And we scale it by log n by n. OK, so now P, this is a fixed matrix. It doesn't have to be in 0, 1. It's just a bunch of positive numbers. And this is the same scaling as before. That means I multiply each element by log n by n. It's solved, but in, in this model, if and only if, you have that the minimum over all i and j that are different. That's the communities. So i and j is in k of this uh, uh, divergence measure, d plus, of the column of pq i and pq j is more than 1. And d plus is this. When you look at two measure, measure mu and nu, these are just a positive measure on a finite set. This would be the maximum over all t in 0, 1 of the summation over all components, let's say i is equal to 1 to k, of the arithmetic mixture of, of new, mu and nu minus the geometric mixture. So it's some notion of distance between 
these two measures. And that you apply this, what is PQ, remember? P was the diagonal matrix, which is P1, P2, PK. Q is your matrix of connectivity, so this is just multiplying each row by the PI's elements. And then the column of PQ, if you look at the ith column, this is telling you what the neighborhood, if you look at one node, if you look at its neighborhood, what it feels like. Each element of this column is how many, uh, how many neighbors in community KECs, in community JECs. It's exactly the column of PQ in expectation. So information theoretically, you can think of the following. This is kind of your channel PQ. And if two columns are the same here, if two columns are the same, then it means that a node in this community you say I and I prime have the same uh, exact. They see exactly the same neighborhoods. So there's no way you can distinguish those two nodes in the graph. So two columns being the same is like a fully noisy, two fully noisy symbols. Like in the channel, when you have uh, two inputs that have the same output distribution, uh, two output symbols that have the same distribution, then you cannot distinguish them. So. So two inputs that have the same uh, distribution, you cannot distinguish them, you can just merge them. Here the same happens. You would merge those communities, they are just the same community. But now the question is uh, how can, you would like to know what measure of discrepancy tells you if those communities uh, see different uh, neighborhoods, you would like to understand when, how much different, and in which, uh, we use, which ma mathematical metric should you measure difference, and that's the, the answer. This is the right metric. So it's not a metric that is convenient. It's not like it really is the one that you need to, to, to use to get recovery. That's one. And uh, this, it, it relates, as I mentioned yesterday in the talk, this object here is an F divergence. So, so D plus is the maxima of an F divergence, which is related to the Ellinger distance. So if you want to recover this result here, well, let's, let's do it maybe. Symmetric case. So it took already 15 minutes or 10 minutes, I guess. There's motion. Yeah, seven minutes. <laughs> minutes okay. So if you want to recover a symmetric case, the matrix Q in the symmetric case uh, is like this. You connect with probability P inside communities and little Q across communities. And uh, the vector P, uh, okay, that there's a little bit of a redundancy in the notation, but P1 is equal to P2 is equal to half for the size of the communities. So if you apply uh, this, so P is A log N, so you can see Q is A, A, B, B times log N by N. So you apply this, it turns out that the maximizer in this case is a t is equal to half because you have symmetric column. Okay. And because it's t is equal to half, then it's exactly the arithmetic mean minus the geometric mean. And this is nothing but this. So that's how you recover that threshold. In general, the maximizer is not at half, and this is what you have to take for the threshold. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, this is for exact identification of all classes. Yeah. yeah. What if I just want to have conditions to, to identify one of them? Okay, good. Let's do that. So let's see, I have five minutes or seven. Uh, there's the coding clustering thing. Um, I think the algorithm will have to drop because it's too long to explain. But maybe I can, then, I can answer your question uh, and then say a little bit about uh, open problems. So in fact, this is a pretty strong requirement to recover all the communities. Let's say that you would like to know, given a block model with some parameters, which community you could recover, or say you want, want just one. So here is the problem. So you, are, you have this, let's say that PQ is given to you for now. We can discuss universal model at the end for open problems. But say PQ are given. Do the following, uh, I call this a CH embedding, because it's, uh, it's just uh, using that matrix for the embedding. You represent each point in, so this is RK now here, R plus K. And I'm going to draw points here, and each of these points is just a column, PQI. So this is PQ1, this is PQ2. These are the column of this matrix that I have there, the local neighborhood. 
And I would like to know which one I could recover, because I may not be able to recover them all. So what you do is you have to solve a packing problem. You have to group these guys in RK in the largest number of groups such that you can ensure that any, if you look at the distance with this D plus matrix between any two nodes that are in different groups, it's always more than one. If you ensure that property, then you can, that you can come up with an algorithm that tells you not in which community this guy is, uh, a node is, but in which list of communities it is. It gives you a list. So if now you want to know, can I extract one specific community, you have to ensure that that specific guy you're interested in, that specific community, these are not the nodes in the graph. These are these abstract points that represent communities. That this node is a distance one from everybody else with that distance. And then you can recover that community. So coding clustering, quick. Okay, can you say one word about efficiency of recovery? Is, yeah. is it always polynomial time? So you here you can do it uh, uh, efficiently down the threshold. And uh, we had an SDP algorithm that was n to the 5, polynomial time. And then we have another algorithm that is, a bit, that is achieving the threshold. And uh, uh, we didn't compute exactly the complexity. But now what we have in the new paper, so by the way, I should mention the authors. So this theorem is with. Uh, is with uh, myself, Bandera, Afonso, uh, who's uh, interviewing all over the place. If you haven't interviewed yet, uh, it's still time. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's all Georgina. And this one here is um, with uh, another student, Colin Sandon, also at Princeton. They're all at Princeton and myself. And uh, now in this new paper, we have an algorithm that achieves a threshold in a general case with a quasi-linear complexity. So it's, that's, that's thanks to the amazing work of Colin. Uh, not only uh, it's, it's, it's general, but it's uh, improving the complexity of the two cases. And so quasi-linear means n to the 1 plus epsilon for any epsilon positive. OK, so the coding clustering is like this. Let's take the symmetric case. That's what we can do really in just in a few minutes. So you have x1, x2 xn, which are uh, your information bits. This is which community person 1 is in, 0, 1, uh, community for the person 2. OK. So this is, this is 3 or 0? OK. <laughs> <laughs> so now what you do is uh, the graph is for each pair of nodes, you're going to look, are these guys in the same community or not? So in fact, mathematically, what you're looking at is the XOR, right? If you take two bits, you XOR them. It's zero, they're in the same committee. One, they're in different committees. So it's a linear code. But it's a strange code that you'll never see in uh, communication theory, because you, you take any pair of nodes, any, and you XOR them. So how many, uh, uh, the number of uh, transmitted bits is n, uh, information bit is n. The number of transmitted bits is n choose 2, because you look at each pair. So the rate of the code is roughly 2 by n. The ratio. So now, each time you look at two guys, it, it, this tells you if they're in the same group or not. And then you connect them with this channel. Same group is 0. The XOR is 0. And you put an edge, which is the output is being 1 for an edge, with probability p. And you put no edge with probability 1 minus p. But if they are in different group, if the XOR is 1, you put an edge with probability q. And no edge with probability 1 minus q. So the variables you get at the output of this channel here which is y12, for example, for this edge, is the edge variable. That's what the output of the channel is. And then here, you will have y n minus 1 n. This is the last edge variable. And these variables are the graph, the stochastic block model. And the problem of decoding those information bits from this output variable of this channel is the problem of uh, exact recovery, of reconstructing the groups from the graph. So uh, this is really a memoryless channel. It's a DMC. We will take it so that the bias is, de is depending on n. So it's a regime that we may not look at in traditional information theory. The code is definitely not a traditional code. Actually, there's, there's one person that has studied this kind of code that might be in the room. I don't know. Uh, maybe he can propose <laughs> himself. Mike Luby uh, with, the, with the kind of uh, um, LT codes and these kind of things, they kind of take not two bits, but really k bits. They XOR them and they send them through. 
So that's the closest thing we have uh, seen in information theory. And, uh, but in that specific framework, then the, the capacity, the, uh, what rate you can support on this channel and whether you are below or above this is exactly the problem of, re of uh, recovering the clusters. So from a converse perspective, you have a sort of Fano type thing quality? Yeah, so you can, you can probably use Fano, and a student is trying to do that. So right now, we need another approach, but it's probably equivalent to these kind of things. But there are, okay, there's a few things to do, but Fano is probably one way to do. Uh, so, it, it, yes? Yeah. If you have such a direct connection, why is the decoding algorithm far more complex in the community detection case than simply decoding this code over the DMC? Well, you can decode that code using whatever uh, coding algorithm you know, but how do you know it's easy? It's still a combinatorial problem. Uh, worse, uh, uh, decoding an arbitrary code is NP hard. Now, this is not an arbitrary code, but you still have to show it as some good properties that you can decode it. So I think I have only 30 seconds for open problem. But I just say one thing very quick, is that if you take the cover and Thomas, uh, your favorite book of information theory, you can really redo it for this actual set setup, because it's really a communication problem in a specific regime for specific codes. You can look at error exponents. You can look at Here you don't have the luxury of designing the next code. No. So you don't have coding theory, but you have information theory. You can look at, for example, uh, if you have multiple networks that you try to aggregate, that's like a broadcast. You have all these things that come into the picture. So, I mean, I can make these things more precise if you want, but uh, you can really take a lot of the chapters in Covering Thomas and think about what the version would be here, and it usually makes sense. So, uh, suppose that you have um, these communities. Uh, you have a graph due to Facebook, and then you have also a graph due to Twitter, and then you have another graph due to Gmail. Yeah. So then you should be able to get more efficient algorithms. Exactly. So you, what, what would this what be? Is known? What is known about this? Uh, very little, but just information directly, this will be a CMO channel or a MISO, multiple input, single output. Right? You have each time, instead of having this guy and this output, you have another set. Mm -hmm. You have, sorry, you have the same, uh, so it's, um, it's a CMO, yeah. And then you go to another set of outputs. And now you can see what is actually the, how much can I recover from this single input by these multiple outputs. Uh, I don't think that I've I read results yet on that. I mean, these, these results are, this is last year and this is this year. And detection also, the results are last year, this year, so. In essence, what you have here are, are graphs that are colored against, uh, I mean, you have multicolors in your graph, right? Yes. So then, yeah, you can. It should not be too difficult. This would be like a vector case. Exactly. It would be like a label. The edges are labeled, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I'm really over time now. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. We might have time for one more question. So, Emmanuel, I have a question. Let's say you don't want to recover all the labels, but yeah. just want to um, answer simple queries of the form is, uh, you know, XI and XJ in the same community. Oh, I see. Could you do this, like, in some linear time instead of hope for... Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, I didn't think about this question. Uh, basically, you, you're asking for less than the clustering, but just some function of the clustering. Yeah, so you just want to find... Yeah, I think you should be able... Yeah, yeah I, I haven't thought about this question, but maybe you can... I would say yes. I don't see why it should be harder, but... Uh, yeah, good question. I, I didn't think about this problem. Any other questions? So, uh, so since yeah. the result was symmetric in A and B, it depends on knowing P and Q? Can it depends you, on what, sorry? You have to know P and Q, right? So yeah, so here I presented everything uh, uh, where you suppose you know. In reality, you don't need to know. Uh, you need to know an upper bound on the number of, of communities. And you need to know a lower bound on the size of the smallest community, and then you can learn those parameters. You know, you expect the results to be clear when A is greater than B. Yeah, that's another thing. If K grows, uh, I think it's... Are you asking whether K can depend on the parameters? Yeah, so I think K can grow slowly with N, like log, but otherwise it becomes... I don't know if that's a question, but... K can grow, but not too fast. Here is a question. I mean, given that there are two nodes, uh, locally see the same distribution, you're yeah. in sparse to giant. How yeah. likely that you'll be able to detect them? Because there's... Uh, locally, this, there's this distribution that looks same. So unless you grow your neighborhood enough, I don't know how you would do that. You would not detect them. I don't think so. No? No. So that's why if, if you have two columns that are the same, there's, it's hopeless to... Oh, this, this question, sorry. If you want two specific nodes or just two communities? Yeah, 
Okay, maybe we should. Yeah, I think, I think I should wind up. So, okay, thank you, Emmanuel. Um, our first unlucky speaker.